Father, we are in need of your grace this morning. Uh, we are thankful for your grace in Christ. And we thank you, Lord, for Dora and Ernesto and Mike and Patsy and the many people that have enabled us to make this possible for us to meet here outdoors. And we know though the venue changes, the purpose does not change. Lord, you are the purpose of this meeting. And Lord, this is your word, and we pray that you would use it to speak to our hearts, to meet us where we're at, and to move us on in a way that would honor and reflect Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a lot of exciting things going on at GBF right now. Some of you may know that possibly this weekend, when you go to the church website, possibly next week, it's going to be an entirely new website. And uh, it's been exciting for me to watch that evolve and develop, and I'm excited about the potential of that. Uh, Just this past week, I had the opportunity to go into the new facility close to Donovan and Sunland Park. And I was excited to count up to nine different rooms that could be used for such things as classrooms, uh, storage, kitchenettes, coffee areas, four bathrooms, uh, a space for worship that would probably double the amount of chairs that we can handle. I think right now we have about 130 chairs. And God willing, we're going to order a few more this coming week. So lots of exciting things. But I think when it comes to people who love Jesus and a search for a church, family, uh, that it's not necessarily how many classrooms or how cool the website may or may not look. I think there's two non-negotiables that people look for in a church. I think the first is that they look for relationship with Jesus through clear teaching from Scripture. They they want uh, a place where in the sermon time, in the connections time, in the care group time, in the children's church time, the Word of God is clearly and accurately taught and lived out. And I think there's a second thing that, that our hearts, when God purges us and redeems us and saves us, long for in a church. And that is we want relationship one with another. We want friendship. Uh, we want a relationship that goes beyond surface and comfortable and Facebook. I've got 125 different people that click like to my posts. We're, we're looking for something deeper. And, and oftentimes, oftentimes a church can have the teaching, but the relationship becomes very difficult. And let me suggest to you that the desire for relationship or friendship goes all the way back to the Trinity. Because do you recognize that God is tri-personal? That the Father and the Son and the Spirit have had relationship one with another for all of eternity. Perfect harmony. And in the Garden of Eden, when God looked at everything He had made, and it was good, and He looked at Adam alone in the Garden, He said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I'll make him a helper, a companion suitable for him. Now we usually go to those passages in Genesis 2, verse 18 and 24, and we talk about marriage, we talk about gender, we talk about sex, we talk about all of that stuff, but there's one thing fundamentally underlying all of that, and that is that you and I were created for relationship with other people. Uh, It is not good for us to be alone. It is not good for us to have just... I don't know, 300 Facebook friends on social media, but not have one or two or three close friends that we let into our soul. We let into our life. We let them by grace peel back the layers of the onion of our hearts and minister to us and we to them. And because of the fall 
in Genesis 3, we find that that relationship, not just with God vertically, but with one another horizontally, became fractured and difficult. I mean, over the years I have met, if not at one, dozens and dozens of people who have been hurt in family and church relationships. And oftentimes the wounds from that hurt, whether it be that of rejection or misunderstanding or whatever the cause of the hurt, leads to an isolationism mentality. Me and Jesus, man. Starbucks, my Bible, my favorite blogs, and Jesus are enough. And God says to us persistently, no, you were built for community, for friendship. What I want us to do this morning is look at probably the most famous friendship in the Old Testament. And it was a friendship between David, a shepherd boy of some 15 to 19 years of age when the friendship started, and Jonathan, the prince in waiting, the son of King Saul. By the way, estimates suggest that that Jonathan was somewhere in his 30s. One guy I looked at even suggested Jonathan may have been as old as 50 when his soul was knit together with that of a teenager named David. And I'm still kind of reeling from that because when I grew up in the Friendship Club flannel graph and flashcard, the picture was of two teenage lads, you know, connecting. We tend to think of the singles community and the marrieds with young kids and the mops, mothers of preschoolers, and we tend to identify with people that are like us. They school our kids like like we do, they do the same sports that we do, they, uh, they have the same Friday evening or Saturday morning hobbies that we do. There's nothing wrong with that necessarily. But I think if you look at David and you look at Jonathan, you understand that they were not synonymous in age, and yet their souls were knit. It says in verse 1 of chapter 18, 1 Samuel 1, verse 18, Now it came about when he had finished speaking to Saul that the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as himself. Well, if it wasn't that they were similar in age, surely they were wearing the same designer robes. Not exactly, because if you go on in the story, I think it's in 1 Samuel chapter 19, when Saul suggests that he give the hand of his daughter to David in marriage, David's response was, I can't marry your daughter. I'm just a dude. I'm just a shepherd boy. Who am I, a shepherd boy, to marry into the kingly family? So when you look at socioeconomic divisions in our society based on your paycheck, based on the color of your skin, based on the type of music or any other things, Jonathan and David's friendship really boils down to two things. Number one, they were both courageous warriors. At different points, Jonathan went into battle against the Philistines, crazy, bold, manning up, courageous for the sake of God. He sees David slay a giant, some nine foot nine inch giant. And I think there's something in Jonathan that resonates with David. That David is a man so zealous for God's glory that when he sees a defiant, giant, idol-worshipping Philistine defy the armies of the living God, he says, I can't take that. And I'm going to do something about it. And I think that's one thing that drew Jonathan to David. I think another thing is that Jonathan and David both had a genuine concern for God's covenant people. They had to have. How in the world could Jonathan, in his right mind, he was the heir from a human, cultural, Near Eastern, monarchy perspective, he was heir to the throne of his father. But early on and throughout, 
he recognizes that God's hand is on this shepherd boy. And he's looking beyond himself to the greater good of the people of Israel and God's sovereign plan. I was telling Marcy when I was thinking about this that uh, I know a pastor friend of mine, actually here in El Paso, a great guy who recognized God's hand of blessing on a very young man in his congregation. And even though he had had the full-time pastor at this particular church for a number of years, he basically went to this guy and the other leaders of the church and he says, I believe God's anointing is on this particular person to be the lead pastor. And he was willing, though he had been in the lead role for years, to take a back seat to this younger man who is now the primary uh, under-shepherd in that congregation. I want to look at three marks of growing quality relationships. Getting beyond the social media, getting beyond the quick text, uh, getting beyond Instagram and Pinterest. And I'm not against any of those things. My family uses those. I'll be a grandpa in January. I'll probably start peering over my wife's shoulder more often to see the latest pictures of the baby, the Wong baby. Uh, I told them they should name him Dowdy Wong Baby, but it's the Wong Baby. <laughs> uh, but I think there's three characteristics of a growing of quality relationships. Number one, these aren't up on your screen, but if you have your notes, you can write them down. I think the first thing is commonality. Commonality. Uh, there's got to be something in view, an end in view in a relationship, in a friendship that's deepening. You know, recently we went on basketball trips to Las Vegas, San Antonio, and Dallas area, and we struck up conversations with the parents and the coaches because we had the common interest that both we and they wanted to see our kids excel in a sport. But a relationship has to have something that goes deeper than a hobby, than a sport, than a knitting club, a reading club. It has to have an end in view. So there's two, I guess, presuppositions here. One is that you, yourself, have been changed by the grace of God. That Christ is your life. That your life is hid with Christ in God. And so your heart resonates when you find another person, be they common in age or older or younger in age, whose heart is bent like David was towards God. I think uh, that is critical in human relationship. If you notice in verses 2 and 4, uh, Saul took David, this is 1 Samuel chapter 18, he took David that day and would not let him return to his father's house. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. And I think that David resonated with Jonathan because they had a common zeal for the glory of Yahweh and they had a common love for the people of God. I think if you and I are going to mirror that, you put it down by the word commonality. I, I did look that up and that is a word. Uh, that we need to invest strategically. I'm not saying blow off you know, your neighbor that hurls profanities at Jesus, that disses the things that God loves, uh, and applauds the things that God hates. You want to build relationship with your neighbor so that you can show them the love of Christ. I'm not saying here that you have to find somebody who is as smart as you in theology. You need to find somebody that has a heart for Jesus and strategically and intentionally invest in them. How are you doing with that? Can you name one person in your life at Grace Bible Fellowship that you were invested in and that the common theme of your friendship, of your relationship, is really Jesus Christ? That's number one. 
a mark of a growing quality relationship. The second mark is constancy. Constancy. And I want to show you this by walking you through this. Moving on in uh, early chapter 18. I think it's around verse 3. It says, Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David and his armor and even his sword and his bow and his belt. This is huge because symbolically Jonathan is passing the baton early on to David and recognizing that David is God's anointed. He is the prefiguring of the Messiah, the greater David, Jesus Christ. Um... And he's discerning that, and he's recognizing that, and he's applauding that. In chapter 23, verse 17, Jonathan says to David, You will be king over Israel, and I will be second to you. But I want you to see the enduring nature of this friendship. Because even after Saul and Jonathan are slain on an ill-advised battlefield, by the end of 1 Samuel, all the way into David's kingship, 2 Samuel chapter 9, he doesn't forget the covenant that is given between these two friends in chapter 18. It's reiterated later in 1 Samuel. He says, is there anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for the sake of who? Jonathan. You see, Jonathan and David were not fair-weather friends. They were in the good and the bad and the ugly. That's what's so neat about how a spiritual family is to parallel a natural biological family. A parent might be disappointed in their kids. A kid might be at variance with their parents. But there's something about natural biological relationship that keeps that family together through the thick and through the thin of life, through life's joys and life's hurts and life's disappointments. And I think we see that all the way through. In fact, in chapter 19 of 1 Samuel, verse 1, uh, Saul tells his son and his servants to put David to death. Now that's a big problem. Because the second half of that verse says that Jonathan, Saul's son, greatly delighted in David. So verse 2 says, Jonathan told David, saying, Saul, my dad, is seeking to put you to death. Therefore be on guard in the morning. Stay in a secret place. Hide yourself. I'll go out and stand beside my father in the field where you are, and I'll speak with my dad about you. If I find out anything, I'll tell you. Then Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, Do not let the king sin against his servant David, since he has not sinned against you, and since his deeds have been very beneficial to you. For he took his light in his hand and struck the Philistine, and the Lord brought about a great deliverance for all Israel. You saw it and rejoiced. Why then will you sin against innocent blood by putting David to death without a cause? Saul, by the way, over, I think, a ten-year period of time, David is fleeing from Saul. He is the real-life Harrison Ford in The Fugitive. And Saul tries to kill him some eight to eleven times. But at least at this juncture in the unfolding of this, he, Jonathan, convinces Saul, the jealous king, to spare David. And Jonathan brought David to Saul and he was in his presence as formerly. So if you're committed to a common friendship, a friendship that's not built just on sport or hobby or political views or more morality or conservatism, and I'm not saying that those things are bad things to form alliances around, but if it goes deeper than that, if it's some expression, I was talking with my kids the other night about friendship, and the word fellowship, koinonia, it means our common life together. And that commonality is Christ, His Word, His sacraments, the Lord's table and baptism, prayer in the name of Jesus, worshiping with the people of Jesus, sharing the gospel of Jesus. Those are the things that I love about the men of GBF. 
Because when we get together, the things they get amped up about is something God has shown them in the Holy Scriptures. Or some conversation they had with a relative or a co-worker about the Gospel. That that's what they're, they're jazzed up about. So there has to be commonality, but there also has to be constancy. And that is going to require sacrificial giving. And in the case of the godly, if you choose to be a close friend to a godly person, what does the Bible say? In this world, you're going to have some trouble. All those who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be what? Persecuted. So at some point, you may be put in Jonathan's shoes. Where later on in the story it says that Saul's anger burned against Jonathan and he said to him, You son of a perverse, rebellious woman, do I not know that you are choosing the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the shame of your mother's nakedness? And by the end of that conversation, Jonathan answered Saul, his father, and said to him, Why should David be put to death? What has he done? Then Saul hurled his spear at him to strike him down. Wow. How many of us know anything of what it means when Jesus said, I've come not to bring peace, but to bring a sword, to turn a parent against a child and a sibling against a sibling? Now we should, as much as possible, be at peace with all men, maintain relationship with family. But at this point, Saul, the dad, turns to kill his own son, Jonathan. And so Jonathan knew that his dad had decided to put David to death. You see, that covenant that was formed between these two friends was pretty significant. How many of you know what a user friendship is? You know, we have these in businesses. If I go to my favorite coffee shop and uh, find out that they doubled a small coffee and they serve it lukewarm, I'm dissing them, man. I'm looking for other ground. If I go to my favorite restaurants and I find some, I don't want to be too descriptive here, but some hair in the food, even though I patronize that place monthly for years, I'm probably, well, hopefully I'll go and talk to the manager, but I'm probably not going to go back. Sometimes we come to friendship like that. You know, it's like a networking process. And we all do this. Uh, we, we hang out for pe- with people because they can be useful to us. There's not necessarily anything wrong with that in the business world. Uh, or we hang out with people because they're cool or they're hip or they're good looking or they make us feel good. Or it just feels good to go tell somebody else, hey, guess who I talked to yesterday? I mean, I do that. You probably have done it yourself. In contrast, the Proverbs says that a friend loves at all times. And a brother is born for adversity. The Proverbs says there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. You see... In a true, biblical, quality relationship with another human being, I do not keep a calculator ticking. A cost-benefit calculator. And at some point, I don't say of my friend, Wow, you're just too much work. You exhaust me. You drain me. See ya. You see, that's not a covenantal, quality, gospel-driven friendship. A friend loves at all times. A brother is born for adversities. Now, I want to balance what I said earlier about the natural and the biological family and the spiritual family. Uh, Because some of you are asking, and I've asked this too, What about your brothers and your sisters? What about your siblings? What about your spouse? Can't they be your constant friend? Shouldn't they be your constant friend? Absolutely. Absolutely. But for some of you young people that are looking towards marriage, please know 
that it's not just chemistry. It's not just romantic attraction. It's not just having a common love of the outdoors, etc., etc., that is going to grow and deepen your relationship. It's going to take something more than that. It's going to take having a sacrificial, common, strategic relationship with that person. Let me ask you this. I guess this is kind of a two-part question. Do you have that kind of relationship with your spouse? I mean, ideally, your spouse should be your best friend. Because there's nothing that God left on planet Earth that mirrors covenant relationship like a husband with his wife and a wife with her husband. Do you have any sibling relationships that in any way mirror that type of constant and common relationship? Dude, I got your back. I've got your back. Remember my dad, he fought in World War II with the Marine Corps and became close friends with a guy by the name of Don Richter. And Don Richter went into missions. He lived in Southern California. And years later, I think when my dad was in his late 40s, uh, he gave Don a call one day. This was probably in the late 70s, early 80s. And he said, Don, I want to honor God's word. The word says don't be any man's debtor. I need to leave the fruitful ministry in El Paso, put my welding hood back on and go back to welding. Could I borrow $30,000 to put a rig together? Truck and all of the goodies that a welder needs. And Don Richter, a missionary, loaned my dad $30,000. See, that's a friend that sticks closer than a brother, but their interests and their common life was the passion they had for Jesus and the kingdom of Jesus spreading to the ends of the earth. I want to kind of move towards this last point. And if you want... Turn in your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 23. We'll read this again. Because I think there are three marks of a growing friendship. One is commonality, one is constancy, and the third is encouragement. And in chapter 23, I want you to see that a lot of water has gone under the bridge. There's been battles, there's been uh, hiding, there's been a slow recognition that Saul is not going to relent until David is dead. There's been a lot of things happen. Through all of that, Jonathan is sitting, if you will, in his palatial comfort zone and David is on the run in discomfort. And in chapter 23, verse 15, it says, David became aware that Saul had come out to seek his life while David was in the wilderness of Ziph at Horsh. And Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David at Horsh and encouraged him in God. You want to write the word down. It's not just commonality. It's not just constancy. It's encouragement. How did he do that? Verse 17. He said to him, Do not be afraid, because the hand of Saul my father will not find you, and you will be king over Israel, and I will be next to you. And Saul my father knows that also. And I love this. Verse 18. The two of them made a covenant before the Lord, and David stayed at Horish while Jonathan went to his house. I think this third word, encouragement, suggests that we need to invest in relationship purposefully. And you know, once you've tasted of this, once you've tasted of the goodness of God, and you have eaten a good meal. By the way, on our trip, I think over the last six weeks we've been out of town, four out of six weeks. I wouldn't even want to begin to count the number of meals we ate out. But I rediscovered what a good meal was this past week eating at Marcia's Diner. And I know I told her more than one night and more than one time, honey, this is amazing. Just savoring really good food. 
I think once we as believers have tasted of the goodness of God and going deeper than the hobby and the sport and the schooling and other things in our political agenda, and we taste with our friend that the Lord is good. It's kind of like you step away from that and you do surface conversation and you just want that home cooked meal again. Let's meet together. Let's talk about Jesus. Let's encourage one another in Jesus. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 and 10 says, Two are better than one. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. I love the story of uh, the Apostle Paul and his friend or his protege Titus in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 5 and 6. By the way, Titus didn't know half of the doctrine or the theology or the implications of the gospel that Paul knew. Paul was probably the greatest theologian that ever lived. He penned the greatest treatise on the gospel, Romans, that ever was. And yet it says in 2 Corinthians that there was a time in the Apostle Paul's life where he was flat out depressed. He was distressed. And it says, For even when we came into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were afflicted on every side. Conflicts without, fears within. But God who comforts the depressed comforted us by the coming of Titus. I'm like, are you serious? Titus must have felt inferior to Paul. I mean, is Titus thinking, if I go to this guy, I can tell he's having a really bad day. The guy is lower than a snake's belly. What can I say to Paul that he doesn't already know? I mean, he wrote, or at some point he wrote, that we know that God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love Him, to those who are called according to His purpose. Our most famous verse for encouragement, right? Romans 8.28. So Titus could have stood back and said, well, what can I possibly say to Paul that he doesn't already know? But he didn't do that. Paul was able to look back on that low time in his life and he said, you know, God comforted us by the coming of Titus. And this is not just for pastors and elders and church leaders. This is for every set apart holy son or daughter of the living God. In fact, in 1 Thessalonians 5.14, it says that we're to encourage the faint-hearted, the ones that are small-souled. Can I make a confession to you guys? I often find myself small-souled. I see my soul shriveling up. I see myself getting more and more pressed in on by the barrenness of a busy life, by the checking of emails and the sending of texts, the relentless entourage of information and to-do lists, and it's on and on. And pretty soon you just get barren. Sometimes you need somebody to come and pour some cold, refreshing water into your soul, like Jonathan did to David when he encouraged him to die. Let me just give you some principles of that. It's going to be a sacrifice. It's going to require sometimes making that effort that doesn't feel good. It's going to require doing nothing out of selfishness or vain conceit, but in humility of mind, considering others better than yourself, looking out not just for your own interest, but also the interest of others. Philippians 2, 3 and 4. It's going to require that. It's going to require when you move into the lunchtime and to the, the booths and to the dunking of the pastor and Tom Ott and others this afternoon, it's going to require for you to intentionally consider how you can encourage and spur on your brother or your sister in Jesus. It's going to involve choosing your words carefully. Proverbs. 25 says, like apples of gold in settings of silver is a word spoken in right circumstances. Can you imagine if Job's three friends had showed up in 1 Samuel chapter 23? How would they have tried to strengthen David's hand in God when he was a fugitive on the run in the desert knowing that Saul was pressing in on him to kill him? They would have said, dude, you just need to man up and dig deep. Go high. 
But you see, Jonathan came alongside of David with a timely word. He knew how to lift up his ailing arms, his drooping arms gently towards God's covenant and God's purpose. By the way, the story of 1 Samuel 18 to 23 is not Saul, it's not David, and it's not Jonathan. The hero of this story is the Lord. He said, you know what? I'm going to raise up a man after my own heart. And his descendant, Jesus, is going to rule and reign on the throne of David forever. I heard about a chapter in a book. It really caught my attention. It was called Grooming Your Pallbearers. Grooming Your Pallbearers. That sounds a little bit morbid. Uh, And it could be that depending on what station of life you're in, when God calls you out of this life into His presence, if you know Jesus, if you're in Christ and not in Adam because of grace, through faith in Jesus Christ, it could be that, you know, it'll just be your six grandkids that act as your pallbearers. But I want you to think about this. If, for some reason, your immediate family was unavailable to carry your casket, who would your loved one or your pastor call? Would there be six people that would carry your coffin who consider you their friend, not just their Facebook friend, not just their social friend, not just their hobby friend. Nothing wrong with those things. Nothing wrong with that. But could they call six people who are godly people who see the world through the scriptural lens who could stand up at your funeral and give a eulogy, an example of how in a low time in their life, a needy time in their life, you came to their side and you gave of your time, your treasures and your talents to lift up their arms. You were that constant friend. You took the time to write the letter, send the email, make the phone call. You were a durable, longevity, constant, covenantal, if you will, friend. You say, Ben, how many friends can you have like that? I don't know that the Bible ever gives us an answer. Jesus had 12. One was a traitor, but he hung out especially with three. So some have suggested maybe at that level you can work it up to three or four. I don't know. That's just a thought for you guys to chew on in your care groups. So I think, you know, I know we're going to get into the fundraiser and that's awesome. I know we're going to get on the new website. That's fantastic. We're going to get into the new building, God willing, three weeks from today. That's, I'm super excited about all that, the potential that has for the kingdom of God for just practically even just meeting the needs of our current body. I think it's going to be awesome. But you know what? There's something that is so much more important than any of those things. And that is cultivating quality, biblical friendships. That's a lifelong growth process. By the way, understand that your wife and your husband or your husband and your best friend can never be Jesus to you. The best thing that they can do to your BFF is point you to Jesus, who said in John 15, greater love has no one than this, and he lay down his life for his friends. Do you realize, Marys, that your best friend, your wife, or wives, your best friend, your husband, will someday leave you? or depart from you through the valley of the shadow of death. But Jesus, your best friend, says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He is our forgiveness, our righteousness, our hope. Maybe you're visiting the fundraiser, all of the excitement today, and you don't know Jesus as your best friend. If you don't know Him as your best friend, the Bible says that you're an enemy of God. 
that God's wrath remains on you because of your sin and because of God's holiness. And that there's only one safe place for you to escape to. And it's not a one-year Bible reading plan at GBF. It's not throwing money in the offering when it's passed by or helping out with a fundraiser. It's by faith, trusting in Jesus Christ alone as Savior and Master. And then He will become your best friend. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we thank You for Your Word. Thank You that we have been able to revisit just little morsels of a very familiar relationship between David and Jonathan. And Lord Jesus, we thank You that these are signposts that point us to You. The One who alone will never leave us nor forsake us. And God, we pray that as we take up the offering that it would be an overflow of our love expressed to you for your indescribable gift that though Jesus was rich yet for our sake he became poor so that we through his poverty might become rich. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask Mark.